going to move right along to Dr. Rubin, who's going to uh, talk about social and cultural determinants of developmental disabilities. Dr. Rubin. Thank you. Hello again. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Mark. Uh, you know, Mark and I have, have been friends for a long time, and, and, and you'll see a a lot of overlap because we, we have similar thoughts and approaches. We shared our slides uh, earlier <laughs> this year, but couldn't help but uh, repeat some of the things. So you, uh, if you hear it again, it's good. It means you, it's important. OK, good. Um, disclaimer, same as Mark's, right? Um, OK, what do we mean by the social determinants of health? What are they? Because um, earlier on, there was a talk about the medical model. It's a concept that you're well, you, you have, something happens to you, you get sick, you get treated, you get better, you carry on with your life. So that sounds like a very simple kind of Newtonian um, uh, concept. The, the, the concept of social determinants makes it so much more complex, and Mark has given you some sense of the environmental, the social, and the... Uh, uh, economic aspects and what the social determinants are are those circumstances in which you live your environment your your income your your the people around you um, and what you do how you do it with whom you do it and those factors are not they don't exist in isolation. They exist within a larger context. The larger context is the uh, economic, political, and social environment. And, you know, we're sitting here in San Francisco, California, in the good old U.S. of A., but there are many other people sitting in different parts of the world, perhaps talking about the same thing, under totally different uh, political, social, and economic circumstances. And their health may well be affected by the factors under which they live. And the people here in this state of California who are living under circumstances that are very different from those that we live in that will affect their health and well-being, and those are the social determinants. I'm going to tell you a personal story. Um, I'm a developmental pediatrician, and uh, I, uh, I, I, I did my medical training in South Africa, and then I went to Cleveland, Ohio, um, Case Western, and then I went to Children's Hospital Boston, the Harvard Medical School, and then I went to Atlanta, Georgia, and I knew a lot about children and development and uh, all very well. And when I landed up in Atlanta, I, I um, started a cerebral palsy clinic. And I started a cerebral palsy clinic in downtown Atlanta. And downtown Atlanta, as with many other major cities in the 1990s, 80s, 90s, was really um, just a place where there were very poor people who, who just had limited resources. And um, predominantly minority. So that was the environment in which I lived. By the way, just over the 20 years I've been in Atlanta, the inner city has kind of emerged like so many other cities that have become gentrified. So, but I will uh, carry on with my story. This is just a picture within our clinic of the orthotist putting on a little brace on a little boy, and you can see uh, the context in which that uh, clinic takes place. A little bit of clutter around. It was really very third world kind of clinic at the time. Um, so what happened was we, we, we had collected data. We took the CDC's criteria on cerebral palsy, and we, we entered the data on every child we saw from the very beginning. And by the time we had the clinic for about four years, we had a couple of students from School of Public Health who came and reviewed our data. And they found, as we would have expected, a complex set of medical and developmental uh, complications. And OK, um, I'd hope to see that and quantify it and so on. But really, what happened was that we found the, the set of demographic factors, which I totally not anticipated at all. And this set of factors said that many of the mothers of the children in our cerebral palsy clinic had been taking drugs during pregnancy, alcohol, tobacco, and um, 
Cocaine was the street drug of, of the times, but uh, there were many others, marijuana and the like, and that they were born prematurely, and that they, when, they were, when we surveyed them, they were not living in two-parent families as you would have expected. And the breakdown was quite, quite significant, and I'll show you now. This is the, 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 the um, rate of prematurity. 28 weeks is, is, is uh, over here, and it was highly correlated with substance abuse. So the greater the likelihood of substance abuse, the greater the likelihood of prematurity. As they got closer to term, less likelihood of substance abuse. So the greater likelihood of substance abuse, the greater likelihood of prematurity, the greater likelihood of cerebral palsy. And now, where were the children living? 60% were living with um, single mothers. 60%. Uh, these are the premature infants. I'm just going to talk about them in blue. So the premature infants, 60% were living with single mothers. Almost 20% were living with grandparents. Almost 10% living in foster care. And only about 17% living with both biological parents. So for me, this was less, a really uh, dramatic turning point because I had not appreciated the fact that these kinds of circumstances, the social and economic circumstances of poverty that lead to substance abuse, that lead to prematurity, that lead to a, a, a family constellation that is predominantly single mothers or outside of the, the family, uh, the traditional mother-father, biological mother-father family with grandparents or in foster care. Um, there was a remarkable paper came out uh, uh, just, over, just under a year ago in April uh, about uh, child poverty, mediators of child poverty. I strongly recommend it, and I'm going to walk through some of the statistics with you. So they looked at child poverty and found that if you looked at poverty, it was predominantly uh, um, associated with minority children. That the uh, families... Uh, tended to have a poorer education. So if they had some college education, only 13% were poor. If they had less than high school, then almost 60% were poor. Employment. If one parent worked full-time, only 9% were poor. If no parents worked full-time, almost 50% were poor. And what do we see as a result of poor, less educated uh, mothers? This is from the CDC and their, their uh, Developmental Disability Surveillance Project. And um, they correlated with age, but if you, these are the ages underneath. But the age was not important to this purpose. It's the degree of the, 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 the number of children with disabilities. So percentage of children with cognitive impairment by mother's education. The darker one is that mothers had less than um, um, a BA and the lightly shaded one had a BA or higher. So the, the lightly shaded ones were more educated. So as you can see, at every age level, mothers who had better education had less kids with cognitive disability. Mothers who had less education had more children with cognitive ability. So it's not just the result of some cognitive ability, uh, at the consequence on the mother, but the consequence on the children. Here's some more uh, issues of disparities. Absence of the fathers in the home is associated with a fourfold risk for poverty. 42% of single female headed families are poor versus 12% of two parent headed families. So you can see where my def demographics coming in. And here's another one. Children of single mothers are at greater risk for infant mortality. They will die. Child maltreatment, child abuse, failure to graduate from high school, and incarceration. I won't even go into incarceration. It is really quite a shameful part of our culture. But I will show you this, which is also shameful. This is disparities in mortality. And this is the, the US of A. Um, this is infant mortality uh, uh, one year, by one year, the number of deaths per thousand live births one year. Bless you. Okay. 
Um, and for wealthy mothers, it's about just over two. And if you look at the whole world, the statistics of the whole world, around two or just under two is what you see in Japan and in, in Scandinavia. It's the best statistic. The statistics for the U.S. as a whole is about six, which is pretty poor. It's somewhere around the 30th or 40th in the world. But if you look at the kids who are poor or disadvantaged mothers, they, they're up there and, and, and really in, in some of the poorer countries of the world. So we have this shameful situation of health disparities, of mortality disparities. Also, the, the poorer kids tend to live in, in a concept called the built... We all live in built environment, by the way. We all live... The built environment is, is, is the environment we live in, like this, this auditorium is part of our built environment. Um, the, the, the street uh, where you walk to come here, the environment of this university campus, all part of the built environment. So built environments are different for different people. So if you look at the built environments of poorer communities, then they're unsafe neighborhoods because of traffic, crime, litter, trash, food desert, and limited green space. Because of all these issues, the kids can't go out and play or can't be safe in going out and play. They could be, uh, uh, could be attacked, assaulted, um, and uh, killed, um, and they can't even exercise. So they stay home and watch TV and eat uh, fast foods because they don't have um, Whole Foods or any of these fancy grocery stores you have down the road here. Um, they also live in older houses with poor condition, and there's three and a half times more likely to have lead toxicity. And Mark spoke to you about lead toxicity a moment ago, and that it's associated with, uh, with intellectual uh, impairment. And they go to older schools in poor physical condition with teachers that are underpaid, underappreciated, and um, really not doing all that good a job. Um, because of a variety of other circumstances. And if for poorer kids, they're 50% less likely to graduate from high school and twice more likely to be unemployed. So you've got poor graduation, unemployment, and you've got um, lead, and you've got obesity, and you've got all these kinds of things. What's happening? This is a study, uh, a report came in Pediatrics 2003 by David Wood, who is, was also a, a, an author in that poverty chapter, poverty paper I was telling you about from last year. David's now at East Tennessee State University. Um, he's done a lot of work on poverty, and this was the, this is what he showed, that if you look at the kids in, um, you know, I'm getting a stiff neck here. On this side. All right, if you look at the kids who are poor versus those who are not poor, you'll see they're more likely to have developmental disability. Um, twice as likely to have uh, grade retention. Wait, this, this is, is it right? I've got to come up here. Okay, good. This is better. I was looking at it like strangely. All right. So they're more likely to have developmental delay, more likely to have learning disabilities, twice as likely to be retained in school, twice as likely to be expelled or suspended, more than twice as likely to drop out, and twice as likely to be unemployed. There's all the statistics for you. So these are poor kids that are landing up in poor schools that, that um, are in disrepair, and all sorts of bad things. Smoking prevalence. Let me just talk about smoking, and I think, Mark, you spoke about... No, you didn't. Okay, I'll talk about smoking. Okay, smoking's not good for your health, so... <laughs> <laughs> and yet, 5.6% of people with graduate degrees will smoke. 9% of those with a college education, that's not a graduate degree, and... 24% who do not graduate from high school. Unemployed, didn't graduate, smoking. Already, Mark was referring to cumulative factors. Let's move on. This is one of my favorite slides uh, because of the message in it. Um, the mother who smokes has, has a problem herself with her lungs and, and other organs, uh, including the brain. 
the fetus gets affected, and we know that, that uh, fetuses exposed to smoking in utero are smaller, and they have um, smaller head circumference, and they don't function as well um, cognitively as their peers when compared. But what I didn't realize was that the toxins of the cigarettes get not just to the fetus, but the fetus reproductive cells. So, what happens is that long-term effects of the offspring of mothers who smoke have other diseases such as hypertension, type 2 diabetes, respiratory dysfunction, neurobehavioral defects, and impa impaired fertility. So the toxin doesn't just affect the mother, it affects the fetus, not just in the size of the fetus and the neuro, neurological development, which I've known for a long time, but by these other diseases and by impaired f fertility. So if we look at the concept of cumulative stress or cumulative problems that affect, can you make it just a little bit darker, please? So you can see the picture clear, all right. Uh, uh, can you see it? Uh, yeah. All right. Okay. Poverty. We spoke about lead, and Mark spoke about other toxins. Greater degree of exposure, um, uh, air pollutants, and so on. Uh, exposure to tobacco smoke, greater likelihood. Unsafe neighborhoods. Stressed single mother. Experiencing violence in the, in the area, child abuse and other violence. Insecurity and anxiety and limited access to healthcare. Because in the poorer areas, you're not going to get the same access to as good healthcare. You don't have the same kind of insurance. Your insurance is um, what the state gives you, and, and you're lucky if you get some good services on that. I don't know what it's like in California, but in Georgia, it's really tough, and, and we have to work with what we had. I spoke to you about early intervention earlier on, and, 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 and the... the um, that is our safety net. The early intervention, the state programs are our safety net. The early intervention programs and the public schools are our safety net. The public schools are where the kids get their lunches, where the kids get their therapies, where the kids get their education regardless. Okay, I'm gonna refer you to a, a pediatrics article in January of 2012 called The Lifelong Effects of Early Childhood Adversity and Toxic Stress. Toxic stress is a phenomenon where children experience strong, frequent, or prolonged activation of the body's stress response system, all the uh, insecurity, child abuse, um, uh, moving, um, fear of, 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 of getting injured, um, without the buffering protection of a supportive adult relationship. Mark spoke about resilience, and one of the most powerful um, uh, positive forces in a child's life is a strong, caring, protective parent. That's the bottom line. Whatever the stresses, whatever stresses might occur, if there is a strong, supportive, consistent, caring adult presence, that child will do so much better. If there is not that buffering protection of that adult relationship, that child will suffer with uh, persistently elevated levels of stress hormones, Mark spoke about that as well, which can disrupt developing brain architecture. We had not realized that it can actively disrupt brain architecture and result in this collection of consequences. Problems with learning, memory, and executive function, impaired decision-making, behavioral self-regulation disorders, um, impulse control, and risk-taking behaviors. And what happens if you don't, um, if you can't learn as well, you, you take risks, you have impulses, and all these kinds of things? This is the collection of long-term outcomes. School failure, unemployment, single parentness, homelessness, substance abuse, gang membership, violent crime, incarceration, and poverty. The USA has the highest incarceration rate in the whole world. It is 700 people per 100,000 population. The next country, good old friend of the USA, Russia.
<laughs> number one. <laughs> um, in Russia, it's 400 per 100,000, okay? And in Europe, it's in the two digits per 100,000. So that's the story. Um, in addition, the, the chronic stress has steroid hormones, and these disrupt not just the brain architecture, but the whole uh, neurohumoral mechanism resulting in obesity, diabetes, hypertension, stroke, and early death. I created this kind of image because when I first realized those social determinants of poverty and, 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 and um, substance abuse, um, I, I created this cycle, it's called the cycle of disadvantage, which is social and economic and disability. Um, and so poverty, poor community support, poor health services, poor education result in uh, feelings of despair and self-worth in the teenagers. What happens is these kids have a poor education. They don't have much of a future. They, they can't see, I mean, when you were young, when I was young, I was like, I'm, I want to be a doctor. I want to be something, you know. You have role models. You have parents who support you. These kids don't. So they get there, and what are they going to do in their lives? And the only thing to make them feel better is, is self-medication. It's self-medication. So they, they, they take drugs and, and sex. Sex and drugs and... Rock and roll, right. <laughs> All right, and so what happens is they get, pregnancy, uh, they get pregnant and they don't take care of themselves and they're taking all these drugs, risks of sexually transmitted diseases like HIV. The babies are born prematurely, low birth weight, fetal alcohol syndrome. The babies are irritable, have medical needs, developmental needs, and these mothers are still these young women who still have uh, a lack of supports and substance abuse and increased demand. So these kids land up with neglect and abuse, uh, foster care placement, uh, neurodevelopmental disabilities, and uh, health concerns, and you have the cycle. So here, that's the depressing part. So the question is, can we make a difference? Okay. Okay. Good, 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 good. <laughs> All righty. We can make a difference. We can make a wonderful difference. All right, and I'm going to just end off by showing you just some examples of the difference we can make. Um, he has a big difference we can make. <laughs> this is a rat mother who loves her rat pup. Um, <laughs> she's a mammal, and she will feed her little pups, and she will look after them until they can fend for themselves. Okay, um, now this is research that comes out of McGill University where they found that they, were, they could, could create these two strains of rats. One where the mother rats fed their little rats and they landed up having low cortisol levels with low anxiety and when they grew up, they in turn licked and groomed their offspring. Licking and grooming, that's what the mother does. She licks them, she grooms them, they feel the sensory stuff, she feeds them, she looks after them, and they in turn become good mothers. Just the licking and grooming, by the way, I had always thought it was just the sensory, but it's turning out there may be some microbiomic uh, phenomenon going on there as well, and that's just emerging as we speak. On the other hand, these rat mothers don't have that same instinct to lick and groom their offspring. So these guys are neglected and they land up with high cortisol levels, high anxiety, and they uh, don't lick and groom their offspring. So you would think this is a genetic thing, so what are you going to do about it? But what these guys did, the researchers did, they took these little pups and they gave those little pups to this mother and she licked and groomed those little pups. And what happened? They went on to lick and groom. So our message is... Our message is that to mothers, lick and groom your babies. <laughs> All righty, so that's the babies. Um, this, this was a, an article in Pediatrics April last year. Man, April last year was a good year for good articles for me. <laughs> Maybe it's the only journal I read last year, but anyway. <laughs> anyway, this is a group who, who um, took 
And, and I like the language they used. They used low resource, lang low resource and high resource family instead of poverty and wealth or affluence and poverty or any other markers. They just used low resource and high resource. And I think we heard that earlier today, low resource countries, high resource countries, and so on. So what they did was they had a group who were control where they did not give early intervention. And these were kids who had some problems in the newborn period. And they gave others early intervention, which is the dotted line. So for the high resource families, you follow, these are the guys who did not get early intervention in high resource families, and that's where they landed up. In the, and for the, for the intervention group, they landed up actually doing a little better than their counterparts who did not have any intervention in the high resource group. But you can see the difference is minimal. For the low resource families, this is the trajectory for the ones who did not have intervention, and this is the trajectory for the ones who did have intervention, which landed up in just where the high resource families are. So, okay, they didn't lick and groom their offspring, but if you give them early intervention, what is early intervention? Stimulation, interaction, engagement, something. The, the positive support that will encourage them. And it comes back to Mark's point about resilience with that balance. This is where you have the positive impact. So we can have it in the newborn period. We can have it early intervention. And this is the one Mark was talking about as well, which is the Perry Preschool Program. This was a, a program, it was 50s or 60s, somewhere around there, uh, where this group of kids, uh, poor kids, uh, was it in Nashville or somewhere, Mark? I don't know, it was Perry. Yeah, well, I think it was Illinois. 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 Oh, right, Illinois. One of those states. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a foreigner. <laughs> what do I know? <laughs> anyway, um, it, it, they, 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 they took um, little kids age um, three, three to five, and these are poor children with a low IQ, and what they did was they gave them two and a half hours of preschool program every day of the week during the school year, and they supplemented it with weekly home visits by the teachers. And they followed them up at 15, 19, 27, and 40 years. So that's a long-term follow-up for you. And what they found was the following. All right? So the intervention is the darkly shaded area and the control is the lightly shaded area. And he has special education and you can see that the kids who did not have the benefit needed more special education. The kids who did have the benefit, less special, special education. For those who scored above the 10th percentile uh, academically, you found many, many more of the kids who had intervention than the kids who didn't have intervention. High school graduation, more of the kids who had intervention than didn't have intervention. Earning more than $2,000 a month, much more of the intervention versus the non-intervention. Own their own home, much more with the intervention and not intervention. And never on welfare as an adult, much more on the intervention. So you can see that intervention at two and three years of age also made a difference. Another group that I didn't display here because of the lack of time was a group of, uh, I think, a couple of million kids in the New England area and researchers from, from uh, Columbia University and Harvard University studied the impact of a teacher in fourth grade and if there was a teacher in fourth grade that made a big difference, it was called a high-value teacher, those kids also went on to uh, get to these levels. And what's more, they saved money for the future. And saving money for the future is looking into the future. And the future is the children. So their children will benefit. So not only do they benefit individually, but their children will benefit. They have a home. They earn more money. They can look after their kids better, and um, their kids will do better. So in summary, infants and children who grow up under adverse social and economic circumstances have greater likelihood of neurodevelopmental disorders. In addition, there's limited access to edu appropriate education and health care that compound the problem. It is our responsibility to identify at-risk children as early as possible and provide appropriate and intensive early support and intervention. 
to assure good access to good educational and educational opportunities and quality healthcare in life. And my conclusion is as follows. Although these issues are issues of like public health and public policy, each of us individually has a responsibility to improve the lives of the children and families we come into contact with or those within our uh, environment. And this is the message I want to leave with you, is that if we can make a difference in the life of a single child, that child can go on to make a difference in the whole world. This is a saying that if you save the life of a single child, it is as if you're saving the whole world. All righty. Thank you.